Hi, welcome to the Career Refresh Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Griffin. I'm a former media and marketing executive turned career strategist and executive coach. I spent my career working my way up and through the ranks of global organizations and startups, and today I show others how to do the same. Join me each week as we discuss the strategies and actionable steps to leverage your strengths, increase your confidence, and develop your career well-being. Ready? Let's do it. Hey friends, welcome back to the podcast. This is your host, Jill Griffin. This week, I have a tremendous leader in the advertising marketing media industry, Marla Kapowitz. She is the president and CEO of the four A's, which is the American Association of Advertising Agencies. And just listen to the level of experience she brings. Over 30 years of industry experience across media, marketing, communications, she joined the four A's as president and CEO to help define and shape the future focus of the association. Under her leadership, the four A's works to improve the industry's health through the power of collective experience, expertise, and impact to empower success for its members across business transformation and talent needs. Before joining the four A's, she was at MEC, which is now Wavemaker, part of WPP, one of the largest advertising holding agencies in the world. And she was CEO of North America. She also spent 12 years at MediaVest, which is now Spark Foundry. And that is where I had the pleasure of working with her. And I consider her one of my mentors. And she also began her career at DMBMB, as did I, before moving on to Amarati Puris Lintis, which is also known as APL. She serves as the director on the board of Penn Entertainment. She is also the chair of the Nominating Governance Committee and a member of the Compensation Committee. In addition, Marla is a member of several nonprofit boards, including the Ad Council, BBB National Programs, which is both the Audit and Finance and the National Advertising Review Board Committee, the Digital Advertising Alliance, also known as DAA, the Trustworthy Accountability Group, or TAG, and Media Village. Marla is an incredible leader. She is strategic. She is wicked smart. She's funny, and she is a mentor and a guide to so many people. And friends, this is definitely one for your notes app. So open it up, or if you're old school and you want pen and paper, grab that too. We talk about how to really stay goal oriented to really embrace change as it comes the difference between feedback versus criticism, and the difference between self-confidence and confidence. We also talk about how to conquer imposter syndrome, and Marla shares some tips that have been affected for her, as do I, and normalizing self-doubt. We all have it. We then move on to talk about how she is helping the four A's lead industry transformation and making sure that we are creating a dynamic advertising landscape. We both pretty much grew up in the advertising, media, marketing, and communications industry, and we both have a great love for it. There are now apprenticeships opportunities that the 4As is working on with Matt Delarella at Catalyte, and I put all of that information in the show notes. And we're also talking about diversity in action, which is everything from the talent we're hiring to driving industry-wide chains to also making sure we have supplier diversity. Friends, this is a really important episode. If you have questions, email them to me at hello at jillgriffincoaching.com. I will get those tomorrow. We will get your questions answered, and maybe we'll even bring her back to do an FAQ at some point. So dig in. I know you're going to enjoy this. As always, here is to possibility, and I'll see you next time. Hey, Marla. It is great to have you here. So great to see you, and I'm really excited for this conversation. I am too. So as I asked all my guests when we start is I'd love you to take us back to the early days. And what is it that you thought you wanted to be when you grew up? I always thought I wanted to be an attorney focused on probably criminal defense because I loved mysteries and solving problems and thinking that through. And when I went off to college at 18, 
laid out my entire four years as a pre-law major and probably within a month realized there were four years of college and then I'd have three more years of law school and I would leave that to uh, my brother to be the lawyer in the family (laughs) and he is and quickly realized I needed to think about something else and by the next year realized that I was interested in advertising and communications and then realized well if I'm going to go into advertising I might as well do it in New York City which is the home of advertising and the mecca and the place to be and left California to pursue that dream and have stayed in the same industry for 35 plus years which is pretty amazing which is amazing people which and do different things, but I I really was very focused once I figured out what I wanted to do. So that sort of begs the next question, which people often ask me is, how do you figure out what you want to do? How did, what would, do you recall what your discernment process yeah. was? And it is hard because you believe, especially when you're in college, you have to figure out your major by a certain time and you have to know what you want to do because it's just the question that you often hear, well, what do you want to do? And if you're going to be a communications major or sociology major, what do you do with that? Because I went to UC Santa Barbara, there was no advertising major. So I remember taking something at the time called the Strong Campbell test, which was meant to break down what your interests were and what possible careers you could associate with that. I never went and got the results of the test because as I took the test, I realized what I was honing in on. And then I took the next year to really figure it out. And as soon as I took a class, we were learning about Ogilvy on advertising. And I thought, well, this is really an interesting potential career. And I was always interested in media. That was always Mm -hmm. fascinating to me. And trying to figure out, well, what do I need to do in order to succeed? So I realized that I was in a small town in Santa Barbara, but I got an internship the summer before my senior year. As I said, I knew I wanted to go to New York, but I felt that I needed to have some experience. And I was very focused on media because especially at that time, in order to go into account management, mostly you had to have an MBA and I was not interested in continuing to go on to school at that point. So I just became very focused on reading up what I could, trying to network. I had an aunt who had a friend in New York who worked at an ad agency. Mm -hmm. I had uh, my godmother whose sister was very senior on the strategy side at another agency, just trying to figure out how could I learn and think about, is this a possibility? And then just got very aggressive around, I need to differentiate myself. I went and spent money to get a resume that looked more like a brochure. So sending that off to New York, it would stand out because I knew these jobs were in high demand. And then I graduated in middle of June, went to New York a month later, spent two weeks. I stayed at my aunt and uncle's house in New York and had a job offer the day I was leaving. I had a couple job offers, but the one I wanted, I got the day I was leaving and went home, packed up my stuff and was living in New York by the middle of August. Oh my God. That actually gets me really emotional. Like hearing someone who had a plan set out, pursued it, you know, it was probably not easy. Even though you had an aunt and an uncle in New York, it is not easy to move across the country without a job to go I'm giving it my all. I'm going to interview my face off and I'm going to make this happen. So I think that shows us a bit early on at the tenacity. And as you said, you thought you were going to be a lawyer solving problems. The first problem was solving your own employment problems. I love that as a really positive grounded story. Um, I believe in being very intentional. So when I am focused on something, I give it my all, including getting my current job. It's like, okay, if this is what you want, you have to put your all into it. Love it. So for our listeners um, and or viewers, um, Marla was one of my first mentors when I came into the same company at DMBNB. We were on the media side. And I remember very early on, which I was always so impressed with and kept this with me, Marla had her goals, her 
actual goals laid out by the CEO in the front of her notebook so that at any given time, she was always clear. She was never rudderless. She was always clear in the goals that she personally was supposed to set out and then also for the department she oversaw. So tell us a little bit about that grounding of always keeping your goals front and center to, especially your professional goals, right? Front and center to what you're set out to do. Because I think that's a brilliant, brilliant insight to do that. I was really fortunate that I worked with really strong leaders early on in my career. And I knew even from my first job, I was reporting into a person who ended up leaving after two weeks. And that was probably a good thing because the person that came in behind that person ended up being such a wonderful guide and leader for me and just making sure that I was always looking out for who's going to be the best person who can teach me. And I went to work on an assignment that I knew the person was going to be really tough, but I also knew by the end of that experience that I would be accelerated in my learning and it would help me grow. So in terms of goals, part of it was just the nature of the profession I chose, which was media planning. And it's always about planning ahead and thinking ahead. And I always need a North Star or something to look forward to. So I was incredibly ambitious. I would say I'm still ambitious. And ambition is a very good thing. It keeps you motivated. And it does keep you focused, too, on what is going to get you to where you want to go. I know a lot of people say, just live for today. That's wonderful. But I also want to know that what I'm doing for today has purpose and is going to take me to that next step and ultimately what I want to achieve for the future. You know, that even symbolically gives me the visual because as I'm always a visual person, like even being in California facing New York, it's like that's the goal you're going towards. You're facing that way. So you're still present in the reality of today, but you're also focused on, okay, but where am I going? Because if I'm going there, I'm not looking back, I'm looking forward. So I love that as a visual um, of, you know, really just staying focused. So you said that you you chose, I think you said you chose to work for someone that you knew would be tough, but that it was going to elevate you in the end. How did you go through that discernment? Because I think that's another thing. Sometimes we're afraid of working for someone that's tough and we're like, oh, this is going to make my life so uncomfortable for the next, you know, 18 months. How did you work through that with your, um, I looked around at who was the smartest person on the floor (laughs) and who worked on one of the larger brands that was more high profile because I started out working on a lot of very small brands and that was a good entry point, but I really wanted to work on a big brand. I wanted to work on P and G and got the opportunity to work on crest, which was a very big brand. And I was so fortunate because I learned a tremendous amount in a short period of time. And there were peers of mine who said, I wouldn't want to work on that business. That looks really challenging. And uh, the joke I had at the time was, this person may make me cry, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) That's what bathroom stalls are for. We can. (laughs) So I would say it's okay to cry at work. Just don't make it a habit. And (laughs) I just truly believe that the person who had worked for them really accelerated and said they learned a lot. So I knew that it was a good experience for that person. And, you know, it's sometimes you don't have to be friends with the people that you work for. It's about what are they going to help you do and how are they going to help you grow? And as I said, I was very ambitious and I was really plotting out what is the experience I need that is going to give me the opportunity to get promoted and Mm -hmm to have the experience that I need to really have this as a career. Okay. Okay. So that brings me to some of the things that I know you and I have talked about offline about, you know, the, the idea that there's a difference between feedback and criticism. And I would love for you to share with our listeners how you sort of, again, figure out well, is this criticism or is this feedback? And then what you do accordingly. I think that will have a lot of people understand that matrix in your head. I think this is so important. For me, 
I've always wanted to know what I can do to be a better coworker, a better leader, a better person who supports others. I have always viewed feedback as input and I am someone who is very candid and direct. I joke with my team, but I'm I'm serious. My greatest strength is I'm direct, but that can be a weakness for people who are uncomfortable with that. I truly believe that you have to be honest with other people. And I want people to be honest with me. And I've been in situations where people will not give me the feedback. And how am I ever to improve or yeah. work on it? Self-awareness is a wonderful gift, but it's really hard to be fully self-aware and in the moment. And you don't always know how your actions and comments impact others. And I just was always open to tell me what I can do better. I looked forward to performance reviews. I would get very frustrated the more senior I got that performance reviews seemed to go away. They they seemed to fall off the chart. Yeah. Just did, or it became a, someone would write on a card, listen, you're doing great, wonderful job, keep it up. How does that help me? Right, and that might be true, but there's still opportunities for improvement. Absolutely, and I want to know those things. I was once in a situation where I was working with an executive coach and I had a hard line report into one person and it dotted into another and I wasn't getting... The, the feedback I wanted, I had the coach do a review for me of from my team and to get the feedback to be able to share that feedback with me mm-hmm. because you and I know there are people that are just not comfortable sharing what they may view as tough feedback mm-hmm. and they may view it as criticism. I don't view it as criticism. Okay. I do know years ago that I read an article that said women tend to take that feedback more as criticism. Okay. It is challenging because we know men and women are viewed differently in the workplace. Performance reviews, you could put them side by side. You generally can see different adjectives are used to describe. We have to really take away that unconscious bias that exists. But I just encourage people to be open to that feedback. But you also have to be discerning around where is this coming from? Does this person have positive intent Are they really trying to help make me better? And is this something I've heard before? Is this a pattern or is this something new? Is it, is it relevant? And you have to really be open to hearing that and processing if it's appropriate, but what you're going to do to try and address it. And is this person trying to help you? Are they sharing the information and leaving you hanging? Or are they saying, here's what I've observed. Here's the reaction it gets. But here's the impact that I believe you could have if you were to do things a bit differently or to think differently. Mm -hmm. And that to me shows that you're caring about the person and what their career is and how they're leading their team or what they're doing that may be hindering them in terms Mm -hmm. of their professional development. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm hearing that. I'm also hearing within that maybe what's not being said, but sort of implied is that if someone's giving you feedback that is action orientated and something that you can actually do, then that's feedback. If someone's giving you input that kind of looks like you're not doing it my way, that's the criticism and a great way of seeing the difference between that, those two. Perfect way to articulate it. And I will also say, if it comes across as personal, It's criticism. criticism. Yeah. And I like the way that you just distinguish those two as well. I think that's really important. Yeah. So the other thing that you and I have talked about is the idea of imposter syndrome. And I hear this regularly from clients of all genders, of all levels of seniority, that even though you may hold a lofty title or a huge position, there are times in which you're saying, like, am I doing this the right way? Am I okay? Am I good enough? Like, should I be doing this differently? Or am I keeping up in, you know, the velocity of business, right? Am, am I am I staying on top of everything? And the, the volume of information that's coming at us, especially if we're working in digital transformation, technology, marketing, I mean, the volume is enormous. 
And there's also been some talk that I've re- read recently that it's like nonsense, which I don't agree with. I think, I mean, I hear it all the time. How are you hearing? I mean, we're going to talk about your position today, but how are you hearing about imposter syndrome? And the second part of that question would be, what would you recommend people do when it starts popping up for them? I absolutely believe imposter syndrome is real. You can call it whatever you like, but the reality is we all have that voice in our head that casts doubt, that makes us wonder why we said something, why we did something. We dwell in the past when in reality we can't change it, but if we can learn from it, then that actually can be positive. I do think it's important that everyone understand it's just happens to everyone and it continues to happen. And it really comes back to having enough, not just self-esteem, but really confidence in what you're doing. And we put such pressure on ourselves to be perfect. I think a lot of it comes from there and there's no such thing as perfect. And if we just allowed ourselves to recognize that we're going to make mistakes, that there are going to be failures, but that they help us along the way. If you didn't have that failure, maybe you wouldn't have had that success. I think we've Mm -hmm. proven that over and over. I am someone who doesn't want to have failure, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen, right? I always believe you have to plan ahead and make sure that you are clear on what you're trying to deliver on. But listen, it happens. And I wish that those things didn't still pop up in our brain. I also think it means you care. I I always tell people when you go to present, it's okay to be nervous. That's your body telling you you care and you want to do a good job. Uh, But take a deep breath and focus on something you're grateful for and it will allow you to just calm yourself. And I would just say, when you have those moments of imposter or doubting yourself. I tell people to keep a brag folder. I used to have a physical folder. Now it's obviously a, (laughs) yeah, but save all those notes, save all the, the positive feedback that you get. And when you are feeling a little down, just go into your brag folder and read through some of it and remind yourself of who you are, what you've done, what you've accomplished. And it really quiets down that voice in your head. Yeah. I like to call it, take your victory lap, right? So your black brand folder is the victory, like go back and remember, which I think ties into the other thing you said around confidence and what, what people often, you know, now you're talking, now this is the coach talking, right? But when people often forget there's a difference between confidence and self-confidence, confidence is I've done it before I can do it again. And then you might say, well, but Marla, I haven't spoken to an audience of this size or given a presentation like this before. And then my response to that would be, but you've done something before that you've never done before. You know how to tackle something you've never done before. And it's not going to look the same way. And you may not execute it perfectly, but that you're able to do something and approach a situation you've never experienced before. Self-confidence is knowing that you can get through any emotion, even if they suck, and get through the other side. So the idea that you can go, oh my God, I'm feeling fear. I don't want to fail. You know, I'm feeling lack. I'm feeling imposter syndrome. And knowing that that's normal and that you can feel that, let it settle, feel it. Maybe it's in your chest or it's in your shoulders or you're like, ah, you know, and then it starts to dissipate. And what we do, and we know this based on evolutionary biology, is we train our brain that when those sensations come up, assuming we're not running from a burning building, that that fear is like, it's all right. It's just going to be there and we continue to move on. So that idea of tapping into confidence, but the nuance of confidence versus self-confidence is, it's always going to be there. Like I run with a little bit of anxiety. It kind of, is just a low level there, but certainly doesn't stop me. I mean, if it stopped me, I don't think I'd show up for work. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I'll share with you a wonderful quote I heard recently from Ginny Rometty, the former CEO of IBM. Growth and comfort cannot coexist. There you go. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Which basically sums up what you just described. Exactly. exactly. One of my mentors always says that um, failure is the currency for success. 
which I also like. It's like, yeah, that's one less way it's going to work. Okay. It's not going to work that way. I got to try something else. And then yes. you keep hacking away until you figure out what that is. But at yeah. least you tried. Yeah. At least you try. At least you try. So I want to step into the work that you're doing now at the four A's, but I'd love you to ground our listeners in really the mission of the four A's so that they're all brought up to speed on the great work that you're doing as president and CEO over there. So the four A's, we represent agencies across the U.S. We have over 600 members with 1,200 offices that reflect close to 85% and direct that spending in the U.S. So our goal is how do we help them not just survive, but really thrive in this business? So we help them with everything from their business transformation needs to talent and It's important for us to really make sure that we're advocating on behalf of agencies, that we're bringing the community together, that we are recognizing the impact that agencies have. But at the end of the day, it's a business and you need support and you need to understand how others are managing that. And half our members are holding companies, half are independent agencies, but we support them, whether it's in Washington, D.C., with any sort of lobbying or legislation, whether that's tax deductibility, data privacy. We have a foundation that helps bring diverse youth into the business and train them and make sure that we're supporting them. We're coming up this year on our 50th anniversary of MAPE, which is our Multicultural Advertising Intern Program. We have over 4,300 alumni that have been part of that program over 50 years, but we need to do more. So If you look at the mission of the four A's, we are still so focused on how we can not just add value to our members, but how do we move the industry forward? And we do that by working in coalitions with the ANA and with others, because there is so much that this industry has done and can do, but we need to really collaborate and focus in on that versus the competition piece of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about one of the collaborations you're doing around the apprenticeship work, which I just think is amazing work that you are spearheading along with um, the folks at Catalyte. So several years ago when the pandemic hit, we recognized that there was a real shift with the future of work as well as with talent. We had the great reassessment and we quickly recognize that not just our industry, but every industry was going to experience a talent gap in the, not not just today, but for the foreseeable future. We don't have enough people to do the jobs that we need to have the right skills. And we continue to rely on an old paradigm of looking for people who have graduated from college. And if you look at other countries, they have very robust apprenticeship programs. The U.S. is very behind European countries, especially when it comes to apprenticeships. And we realized that a lot of people were saying, why do we need to have people that have a college degree if they have the right experience, if they have the right exposure? And we dropped our own four-year college degree. We have seen a lot of agencies drop that. And to get them people on a different path of learning, you've seen companies like Google and Meta invest in accelerated training. And we were looking to partner. We recognized it was going to be more challenging to build this ourselves, but to partner with an organization that would identify this incredible talent that maybe didn't have the same path as others and didn't have a four-year degree or a two-year degree, but really had the aptitude and the attitude to learn the skills. And Catalyte had been working to develop software engineers for over 20 years. And more recently, they started to develop talent for digital and specifically Mm -hmm. programmatic and also starting to get in the analytics side. So Matt Dorella, who used to be at Twitter, he and I got connected. He was on the board and then became their CEO. And we recognized there was a real opportunity to come together. And what we liked about Catalyte was other companies had a year-long apprenticeship. And in the reality world of agencies, Um. you don't have time to have people come in and then take a day off a week for a year to continue that learning. There's obviously continued learning from the agency side, but we need to give people an accelerated learning path. 
And that's what Catalyte does, depending upon the topic, eight to 12 weeks, they are paid to get that training. And then when they come into the agency from day one, they understand what their job is, how to perform it. And what we're doing is we're supplementing that with training like agency fundamentals and some other types of learning that we have as part of our learning institute to make sure that those people are successful. And so if you look at the people that have come in, they are from all different backgrounds. Some do have some education, but they come into these jobs. They're more loyal. Uh, They see this as a real opportunity to have much more financial security than they would have had in their previous roles. These are people that come from everything from manufacturing to retail, and they bring a different set of maturity and think differently about what they can contribute. And so we're excited because there's also a very strong diversity component to this, which helps us really start to change the industry because we've not been the most welcoming when it comes to socioeconomic differences as an industry. We know that entry-level advertising people, they typically are offset or have to live at home or do other things in order to afford to really wait out to get the promotion to really uh, be able to pay for things themselves because they're in large markets and it's expensive to live in big cities. I mean, I was a waitress and a bartender for the first few years working in advertising. It's the way I had extra money to afford, you know, the haircut. (laughs) I sold my car to move to New York. I mean, just do what you have to do to make it work. We need to be more welcoming as an industry uh, to truly embrace that diversity and be inclusive of everyone. But how exciting that we can bring in different types of people and Catalyte goes into a market and they will identify, it's a pretty rigorous test that they do this assessment, the top 5% and they then quickly get them into this training program. And not everyone passes the training program either. So it's a pretty rigorous process over that again, eight to 12 weeks, depending upon the topic. And so our goal is to continue to grow out new cohorts like project management, account management, so that we can start training people in other areas too. Yeah. I think I read something like 90% of the apprentices get a job at the place that they're doing their apprenticeship, which is yes. amazing. <laughs> like you're beating the stock market. Like that's amazing return. And it's a, I always call it a try before you buy because they come in for six to nine months and then you get the decision of, well, do I want to hire them full time or not? But imagine you win a piece of new business and you need people immediately. Again, you have to give some advance notice so that the training can happen, but you literally can have those people start from day one and they can be incredibly productive because they've already had not on the job training, but like on the job like training. Her. So if someone's listening and it feels that they would want to be a potential apprentice or candidate, how, where do they, if they go to your site, do they go to Catalyte? Like how do they get involved? Catalyte, and they can then figure out how they can get, take an assessment and potentially go down that path. If they want to actually take advantage of the apprenticeship, they can go to our site. We have all the information and it'll take you to, get that connection through Catalyte and be able to start working with them. Awesome. And I will put those links in the show notes for everyone. So you know exactly where to go. So I want to look at the other side of the coin and that's in, you know, in recent years, yes, the great reassessment, but also there's been a bit of an exodus of the 40 year old plus employee, some by choice, some not by choice. And I hear a lot of them would like to get back into the industry. They loved it. What are you seeing slash do you have advice for those people who are those more experienced candidates who are trying to get back in and feeling like, oh, I'm I'm aged out now because I'm over 40? Yeah, this ageism issue is is I'd say it's a big issue we have to address. And there are several industries that deal with it, including ours. And if you look at these people, they have the most amazing experience. And the challenge is that they also probably have high salaries that go along with it. And as people are managing costs, they're looking at everything they need to do. The other reality, and you said this earlier, is the velocity of this business does not abate. It is fast paced and you need to spend every day learning. Mm -hmm. And 
growing and understanding what happens. That's regardless of your age. You sure. need to stay on top of things. There are so many wonderful seasoned people who also may have been in one role for many, many years and then say, you know what, I want to do something different. And that to me is the beauty of this business is that there are a lot of different paths you can pursue. I know that there are many agencies that are doing returnships. They're doing different types of mentoring programs where they're bringing in senior people to come and manage that way. Mm. I, it's also important for the senior people to really think about, well, what are they, what are they offering and how do they position themselves a little mm -hmm. bit differently? But I do worry that we need to get more and more people open to it. it yeah. If you look at the, the median age, it is uh, very it's young. It's 38. Right. But that's because we look at most organizations and they're usually some sort of pyramid where you have right. a lot of more junior people. And as you go higher up, it whittles down and it's questionable. Well, what are those middle managers doing? So we have to we rely so much on those everyday workers, but that doesn't mean they have to be 23 years old. Maybe there are mm -hmm. different ways of thinking about that. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity. I just truly believe as long as you are growing and demonstrating your value, you are going to be around. Yeah, I would agree and with that. If you are not, then that's not the organization for you because they don't recognize your strengths. And there are organizations out there that will. Uh, more and more, I keep hearing, well, we need more senior people that can talk to senior clients. So, yeah. and there are advantages there. We're very fortunate, the four A's, we have a very strong multi-generational workforce and you have to just manage that and everyone should be dealing with that. But it brings, again, diversity, different mm -hmm. perspective and having people work together from multiple generations is incredibly beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's also that mutual mentorship, right? Where I was talking with some Gen Xers saying how they're having such joy in mentoring Gen Zs and how the Gen Zs are equally mentoring them back in other ways so that it's creating this really stronger, more connected workplace, which of course I love hearing. Um, and just to be clear, the thing that I said about 38 years old is the average age of the U.S. So you think about the buying power of the U.S., you know, average consumer. You want to make sure that you have a representation of who's coming up with the ideas and the campaigns to be able to speak to the audience. You know, I mean, I always laugh because I'm of a certain age that people would assume I have children in college. Well, I don't have children. So what do I do with my discretionary income? Like, you definitely want to market me. <laughs> because right? I'm doing other things with my money. Well, and also senior people, because they have that experience, they might actually be able to get the work done a little bit faster because they don't have the stops and starts or the learning curve that has to occur at a more junior level. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just a couple of other questions. I know that you personally are a champion of diversity and also the four A's is putting a lot of emphasis there. There was the recent report that came out saying that actually we're going in the wrong way, that the agency community is uh, basically getting whiter at the senior level. So what are some of the initiatives that are happening that people who, again, who are listening can feel like, okay, we really are trying to address this? Yeah. And what you're quoting is our recent diversity and agency survey. And the headline was around agency ownership. And oh, okay. It, it, it's still a problem. It's, it's, it's an absolute issue. There was some improvement in Hispanic Latinx, a very slight improvement in Black African American. The, the issue is it's, it's not changing enough, and we are going backwards in many ways, and the C-suite is not changing, and that's the problem. So it's no surprise that you don't see a shift in ownership when you're not changing the C-suite. You, mm. you need people to be senior you need to have that credential in order to go start your own business, to be able to get the capital to start your own business. We have gone from, unfortunately, what was a movement to these moments, and we need to really double down on what this means. This is not just about the talent or the composition, which the survey focuses in on. This is how you do your business. This is how you look overall 
from everything you do, the work, the people, the clients, the way that you are working with suppliers, everything you do needs to have this lens on it. And there are a number of agencies that we work with that take this seriously, that have really demonstrated the positive impact it can have on their business. Mm -hmm. And they are open sourcing their playbook, the way Mm -hmm. they've done it. And what we're going to be doing is aggregating all of that on our site so that people can access it because there's some really terrific programs out there. And I always say we should not be precious about DEIB. We need to share what's worked, what's not. But we need to recognize that this is hard work and you really have to stay committed to it and it will benefit your business. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is it makes a difference and we've got to give a voice to many more people, but we also have to be training that mid to senior level. That's why we have a program called Vanguard, which we started out with Black professionals. We're in our third year and we're getting ready to launch a cohort for the Latinx community in the fall. So we have so much more work to do. And I would just say to everyone, think of what you can do as an individual, what you can do within your own team and what you can do within your organization. Doesn't matter how junior or senior you are, you have to be vocal and you have to speak out and speak up. And I've been in situations too, you have to be intentional. You have to really think about what it means across the entire business And you need people in your organization to call you out when you're slipping and falling back and not hearing conscious bias. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's an interesting point. You know, a few months ago, I had um, a friend and former colleague, Heather Keats, write on the podcast. Um, She was the first Black editor at Martha Stewart when I worked at Martha Stewart. And she's now the co CEO of an agency rights creative with her husband. And we talked about, cause she's a certified minority owned business. I'm in the process of getting certified as a w- female women owned business for both federal and state contracts. And what often happens with the agencies and the holding companies is that they put you through the same rigor that I can't hire the attorney to go through the 700 page contract but then inadvertently, you want to have a diverse set of fractional talent, of, you know, strategists, or even, you know, come in and help on a pitch. But you've made it as such that I actually can't even compete because how could I possibly go through that? I mean, I remember talking with one holding company and they ran a Dun & Bradstreet on my LLC and they were like, oh, but you're a new business. I'm like, I'm one strategist. I'm just... <laughs> like, sorry, my Dun and Bradstreet number isn't strong. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like, I think we also, you know, I always bring the humor to it, but I think we also need to think about if we want diverse talent, the rigor you're putting on a Fortune 100 vendor, it has to be different than the rigor you're putting on freelance contractors and fractional, because my Dun and Bradstreet number is never going to match a major holding company. So we totally agree. We're actually, we've been working with the ANA on this, on supplier diversity. We've published guides for buyers. We've published guides for diverse suppliers on how to work with agencies and marketers. Um, We're about to come out with some more guidance because we keep getting the question around, well, what's the benchmark? Don't worry about a benchmark. Get started. Do this now. Focus in on your goals, your objectives. Look at the population. Look at who's not just buying your product today, but who's going to be buying your product in the future? Look at the changing demography of the United States. You have to be thinking differently about that. And so I am appreciative and empathetic to your situation because it is something we've also looked at, which is certification. It's expensive to go through certification. It's time consuming. And then to your point, even when you have the certification, you might have to go through a lot of different hoops to manage it because you've got large companies that want to check off, well, you're a diverse supplier and you're going to hit my tier one, tier two, tier three, whatever that may be and hit my objectives. So it is an issue that we are actually talking to the to the media agencies about because they all care very much about this issue. They want to help diverse suppliers. They want to really make sure that we are changing the landscape and identifying more content and inventory because 
that's wonderful to have all these commitments, but we also need to make sure that we're helping to support these people and help them grow their businesses too. That's so awesome. there are awesome. few companies out there that are doing it well, but not enough. And I just hope we can start to try change. The good part is we're starting to have a conversation around what's diverse owned versus diverse managed mm. and diverse targeted. I mean, you can have a company that is not diverse owned, but I know one company, my code, they're like 85% of the people that work there are diverse in the way that you would define from race and ethnicity. And more importantly, they're hiring diverse creators. So Amazing. they're benefiting everyone. So why don't you think about ultimately what your goals are and your objectives? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. All right. So as we start to wind down our conversation today, I want to ask you a few more questions that um, I think help people see that there are different ways of working. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about like, how do you get ready and start your day? What's your morning routine look like? Are you an exerciser? Do you meditate? Do you just help the kids get out the door? Like, what does it all look like for you? I wake up and I will either have showered the night before or sh shower in the morning. Uh, I get ready. My ideal day is to get up and go for an hour walk. I live on the Upper West Side. So go for a walk in Riverside Park and listen to podcasts. So that is my morning meditation. It is it. to clear my head. Uh, did it this morning. And I just, it's a great way for me to just ease into Even my day. day. Yeah. I am not Someone who is obsessive the second I wake up looking at my phone, I don't look good. I don't look <laughs> off at night. I I don't want anything. And even as I'm walking, I'll often just make sure my phone's on silent so I don't have to hear any texts coming through. I just don't want anything interrupting that. And then I get into work mode, whether I am working from home or working from the office or going into the office, uh, sorry, going to a meeting. Uh, and then I get into my day, but I, I like to know ahead of time, what is my day going to look like? Uh, and I plan ahead for the week and I think yeah. through, Oh, do I need to lunch prep? And right. when, am I gonna <laughs> when I'm going to, when am I going to be traveling or doing different right. things? But uh, right. that, okay. that's good. good. I love it. Um, when you think about your career trajectory, right? You know, long standing within agencies, eventually being CEO of Wavemaker, MEC Wavemaker, um, and now, of course, president and CEO of the four A's. What was harder than you thought it would be in your career trajectory? I always tell people the hardest shift is when you first start managing a larger group of people. Oh, that's good. I've always felt that that was a real shift for me because you're not just responsible for yourself, you're responsible for the well-being of this team and everyone is very different and yes. you have to learn not just about how they are professionally, you have to understand them personally. And I, when I was at Media Vest, I actually worked with Erica Rosengarten, Kendra Hatcher on something where we laid out this grid where we talked about performance, which is very objective. And then you talk about fulfillment, mm. which is very individual and very subjective. And so my goal was always to understand, especially for those high performers, what fulfilled them. And it was different for everyone. And that to me is key as a leader is to really understand those nuances. Was it challenging when I went from being president of U.S. clients and planning at MEC to CEO? Yes, that was definitely a leap. But I was fortunate that uh, someone had said to me, well, you, you've had big jobs. You know how to do a big job. So you might have to do more travel, but you know what that's like to manage that. And Every next role is an adjustment, but it's also exciting because yeah. you get to do new things. And for me, I tell people, I don't do status quo. I find that very boring. I need challenges. I need to grow personally. I like to iterate. I like to evolve organizations and teams. And that's what's motivating. And I love to watch people grow uh, yeah. and mentor people. Love it. Beautiful. Okay. Last question. 
what book or podcast would you recommend to our listeners? So I mentioned I listen to podcasts. I call it feeding my curious brain. So my favorite podcast, which I'm sure a lot of people listen to, is Pivot. I just Love. can't get enough tech, politics, business. Kara Scott duking it out. Uh, I I talk down. about them like they're my friends. I'm like, well, Kara yes. Scott said. <laughs> But it, it is, that is uh, one of my favorites and the one that I make sure I listen to both episodes every yeah. week. Yep. It, yep. I'm never behind on that one. It's a good one. That's a good one. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for, I mean, you have a crazy schedule, so I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. And I know many people are going to benefit and just hearing the path of someone's journey is always inspiring. So thank you for the generosity of your time. Thank you, Jill. And by the way, we're all busy and we all just make time for what's important to us. (laughs) And on that, we will end it. Thanks so much, Marla. Hey, thanks for listening to the Career Refresh podcast. If you're enjoying this and you want more information, go to my website, jillgriffincoaching.com. There you can find information on how to work with me one-on-one or my group programs, or even bring me into your workplace. I'll put the link to my website in the show notes. But hey, listen, before you go, do me a favor, rate and review this podcast because it definitely helps me get the word out to people everywhere so that they can also thrive in the workplace. All right, friends, I appreciate you. I'll see you soon.